Okay, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome back to the weekly Parsha Shir. It's a double Parsha this week. Parsha is Bahar Bechu Chaisai. And the, the second Parsha, which is the last Parsha in Sefer Vayikra, Bechu Chaisai is a very intense and a serious Parsha. And since the nature of this year is to be very serious and intense, so we're going to go with Bechu Chaisai. And we know that it has in the midst of of, of the Parsha, it has what's called the Klalais, it has all of the curses that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is threatening to bring upon Klal Yisrael. If in fact, in if we don't go in the ways of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's Torah, if we don't learn Hashem's Torah properly, if we don't guard His mitzvahs in the right way, if it's not, doesn't mean the world to us, so then HaKadosh Baruch Hu watches us go in other directions. And once that he watches a Jew go in another direction, HaKadosh Baruch Hu cannot really be soivo. He cannot handle that for too long. He gives time. He gives warning. He gives little, little missiles flying here and there once in a while just to awaken and to awaken a person up. But when it gets to the point where HaKadosh Baruch Hu sees so much Bechukaisai, that we're not going in the ways of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, says HaKadosh Baruch I don't have a choice. The only way that I could deal with the problem and extricate the, the, the spiritual maladies and diseases that are there is to send over the colors, the curses in this week's Pasha. I'm just remembering that last year, I believe it was during this Pasha, as they're reading the colors in here, the kids, there were like tons of kids on Shabbos and they were all playing outside at that time. So you hear the kids, the the the, Shali, the Balkari who's reading is talking about you're going to be destroyed, you're going to die, the earth is going to fall apart, the Jewish people are going to be flung to the corners of the earth, all terrible, terrible things. And you hear the kids in the background laughing and screaming and playing with each other and running and jumping and all the different things. And very often that is the way that we are in our lives. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is sending messages He's sending, he's trying to awaken us that we should see what our Kodesh Baruch Hu wants, but we're like those little kids. We're too busy playing. We're too busy having fun. We're not aware, we're not focused in, we don't see what's going on right in front of us. Now that being said, I'm not going through the curses tonight, so don't worry. We're going to go to after all of the colors, after all the curses, the end of the parsha is almost like a, a sidebar, and it's a very big question. Exactly, what is this part? What is this part of the parsha doing together with all of the klalis, all the curses that Hakadosh Baruch is referring to? And that is, as you look, if anybody that that wants to look inside, it's in Perichav Zion. It starts with the pasuk Aleph, and it gets to something called Erechim, which is the vows, the voluntary vows that a person makes to donate the value of himself to the Beis HaMikdash. A person, a person decides that they want to make some kind of a commitment with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And so what do they do? They take a numerical value, which ends up being according to the age of the person themselves. And they end up dedicating that to the Beis HaMikdash. And now the Beis HaMikdash is able to take the money. They cannot use it for anything they want. It can only be used for Dvar the Kedusha, holy things in the matter. And therefore, they will now give it over. They give that money to the Beis HaMikdash. And the Mephoshim all really are bothered over here. What Shaykh is, what is the connection? In the beginning of Parsha's Bahar, which is the first Parsha, it speaks about Shemitah and Har Sinai. And Rashi writes over there, Ma Shaykh is what is the connection? Ma Shmita Eitzel Arsina. What is Shmita? The, the midst of Shmita, of letting the land lay fallow for seven for one year at the end of seven. What does it have to do with Har Sinai? All the Torah, all the myths were given over Har Sinai. Why is the Torah singling out Shmita over there? And the, and the Rashi and the others give their answers. But this famous concept is Ma Shmita Eitzel Arsina. What is the midst of Shemitah have to do with Har Sinai? So the same thing is asked over here. Ma Erechin, what is the midst of Erechin? This that a person decides to donate 
their value and donate that to the base of Migdash, to the sanctuary, to the Mishkan, wherever they were, in order that the base of Mishkan have more money from them to go be able to buy the things that they want to buy. Ma, ma erichim ate so close. What does that have to do with the close? The close just finished the curses. And after the curses, by the way, there's something called erichim. So I want to discuss two answers. One I heard personally, and the other one is here in, one of them is in, is in Rav Hirsch's commentary on Chumash. And Rav Hirsch writes in such a beautiful way that up until this point in the Parsha, everything is Torah, Chukim, Umishpatim. Everything are all of the mitzvahs that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants us to keep. And if a person is careless, if you keep them, if you go on my mitzvahs and you'll follow what I say and you'll do the commandments the way they were meant to be kept, so then says the Torah, oh, look at all the brachas, look at all the blessings you're going to have. Everything in this physical world will be taken care of for you. You won't have to worry about a thing. You won't have to worry about parnasa. You won't have to worry about your health. You won't have to worry about the rain. You won't have to worry about the drought. You won't have to worry about your cattle having enough food to eat. You won't have to worry about the grass growing. Everything will be in place because when Klal Yisrael is learning Torah and Klal Yisrael is keeping mitzvahs, we are living the life that HaKadosh Baruch has set us here in this world to live, and therefore everything about the universe, it just coincides and it works out the way that it's supposed to. So if you follow my mitzvah, says HaKadosh Baruch Hu, everything works out. The im, im love, if you don't, im then comes along all the clothes, all the curses, because you trampled over the Torah, mishpatim, all the different types of mitzvahs that HaKadosh Baruch Hu did. And obviously, the goal of everything is that we should be God-fearing, Torah-keeping Jews. That's what Hashem wants of us. He's not interested in all of our shtick. He's not interested in all of our, our, our creativity. HaKadosh Baruch is interested in one thing. Are you keeping Torah and mitzvahs? Now, you want to do it in a colorful way. You want to do it in a creative way. You want to do it in a, in a jumpy way. Whatever, however you want to do it. But just one thing, at the end of the day, when you go to sleep, just make sure that you kept the mitzvahs today. That's what HaKadosh Baruch wants. That's what Hashem is looking for. So what is the voluntary offering of Erechim, of giving, of consecrating and dedicating the value of yourself to the base of Mikdash? Where does that fall into play? So Rav Hirsch writes that the truth of the matter is, Hashem's, the Torah is coming to point out a very important part, uh, point, and that is the following. That in the Mishkan, which was what was in the, in the Midbar, in the wilderness, the Kahanim saw their mission not to gain possessions from other people, but not to have more things in the base of Migdash. You know, it's like, and the, the shul is the, is the dump off area for all Shemus, for all antique and old books and papers that parents have been gathering in their home for years and years and years and years. And then you get a call. Uh, did they have a Seamus pickup? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I don't know if you saw the note that we had it before Pesach time. We actually offered you a service. You could bring your, oh, you know, I missed it. Do you have room for just like one little box? Um, I mean, how, how big is that? It's small. It's really small. You'll see. Okay. So they come with like a, you know, a Mack truck and they get a, a, you know, one of the forklifts and they pull off the truck and they bring it into my office. Do you have room for this in your office? Sure, no problem, not a problem at all. I'm not looking for extra old books at Makarachaim. So in the beginning, people thought it was nice, they'll donate old books to Makarachaim and we'll be able to put them on the shelves. But you know what? Nobody reads old books. I don't know if you know, they don't read new books either, but they certainly don't read old books that are falling apart. So we're not looking for new books or old new books at Makarachaim. Says Rav Hirsch, the Kohanim were not looking to get money so they could go and buy new objects for the Mishkan, for the Beis HaMikdash. They were concerned about one thing, and that was they wanted to gain the hearts and the souls of Klal Yisrael. And the whole purpose of everything, the Mishkan, the Aveda, for Klal Yisrael, for the Kohanim, for everyone together as one is, that we should fulfill the chukim, the mishpatim, and the Torah that HaKadosh Baruch has given us. That was the mission. They're Oyed Hashem. They're the servants of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Kohanim. They're running the Avoid, the service in the base of Migdash. 
Their main goal was that we should have a nation <laughs> that is gathering together in order to keep the mitzvahs in the best possible way. And they wanted us to sanctify our morality and safeguard justice in society and the enlightenment of the mind and the ennoblement of the heart. So the chukim and the mishpatim and the toyrois, when a person keeps all of those, that is the sole means in a person's life of attaining grace in the eyes of Hashem. That's the way we become endeared by HaKadosh Baruch. When you hear people say, oh, he's such a good person. You see? What's so good? Oh, he's so nice. He does so many wonderful things. What does he do? Well, he did this, he did that, he did that. Yeah, but how is his Yiddishkeit? How is his Torah? How are his mitzvahs? How is he doing in that area? Well, you know, he's a nice guy. Okay. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I'm not looking for nice guys or nice gals. I'm looking for people who are living a life that is in line with what I, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, am asking for, Torah, mitzvahs, mishpatim, chukim, and the like. And that is, the mitzvahs are the, inter, is the only thing that will mediate between man and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The mitzvahs are what bring us closer to Hashem. And that's how a person has to think about their life. What is it that's going to bring me closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu? What's going to keep me in His presence? What's going to keep me reminded constantly throughout the day that I'm a, I'm, I'm a servant of Hashem? Well, HaKadosh Baruch Hu filled up our life with many mitzvahs, 613. And those 613, you can find thousands of mitzvahs in the 613. So a person could be busy from night, from morning until night, with mitzvah after mitzvah after mitzvah to remind himself, Shevise Hashem Lenegi Samir, I'm standing in front of Hashem. Says Rav Hirsch, the Torah is telling us over here that Erechim is extra. If you want to go and be a nice person and you'd like to make a voluntary offering where you are sanctifying and consecrating your money to the value that is you, that's fine. And that's very nice. But this comes after you went in my mitzvahs and you get rewarded. This comes after you didn't listen to my mitzvahs and you get punished. This comes after the fact. The ikr, the main part of Klal Yisrael is Torah and mitzvahs. That's what we're here to do. You want to do something extra? You want to give a voluntary dedication to the base of Mikdash? That's very nice, says HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You make me very happy. I'm very pleased. But please do not think that your life is all about the extras that you're going to add on. Please understand that your life is really about the main body of Torah and the main body of mitzvahs, which is what the entire parsha before this is all about. So Rav Hirsch learns it that over here, the fact that the Torah makes us like a, an extra thing, like a sidebar at the end of the parsha, is coming to teach us just that. And that is that it is nice to give to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and it's nice to do extra for Hashem, and it's nice to find it inside of yourself to want to dedicate money and possessions and valuables to the base of Mikdash and the Revolution. That's all beautiful. But that's not the Ikra. That's not the main thing. The main thing is, from morning till night, are you keeping the mitzvahs that HaKadosh Baruch has given us? From the time that you wake up in the morning to go to sleep at night, can you keep track of how much Torah, you learned how many tefillahs you daven, how much, how many, how much chesed you were involved with. Can you keep track of that? If you can, Gavaldik says Hashem, um, you, you say, Lechi, you're going in my midst, I'll give you brachas. But if not, Rahman Lutzan, there's something called the klala that comes to this world. Extra? Very nice, he says. But extra is not what it's all about. You don't win points like, you know, you take a test and you skip all the questions, but you do the extra credit. And you get the three extra credit points, extra credit questions right. And then the teacher gives you a fail on the test. And you say, wait a second, but I did the extra credit. Yeah, but what about the rest of the test? You left out the first 20 questions in the test. How can I give you an A++ because you only got three points on the extra credit? It doesn't work like that. 
That's not called the Baruch Hu. Extra credit is nice, but it's extra credit. The main credit is the world of Torah and the world of mitzvahs, and that's what we're supposed to be involved in. Now, he does say at the end over here, you should know one very beautiful idea, and this, I think, will bring us in to the other part. And that is that the word Eirech, which is Eirech, in which we're describing over here, it's not really referring to a monetary value that you are dedicating and consecrating. Rather, it's an expression of the ideal value. And it represents the ideal value of a person to Hashem and his mission and his sanctuary. And that this value is universal and fixed. I don't donate more for myself than for you. Whatever age bracket I fall into, it's the same amount of money. Says Rav Hirsch this idea. And that is that every single neshama that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has brought to this world has an intrinsic value in it. And I'm not going to say that I'm greater than you or that you are greater than me. Every neshama has value, has power, has potential that's in it. And that in and of itself is what we are consecrating to the base on Mignosh. So on one hand, the verse is saying, keep in mind this is extra credit. On the other hand, when you do an erichim, when you give over this vow, so you are exclaiming to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I'm beginning to recognize the tremendous value that is there inside of my neshama. And because of that, I am motivated at this point to take money, which is not an easy thing for people to part with. I will take the money and I will give it to the base of Mignash because I'm showing that my neshama, the soul that you have given me, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that you bestowed in, inside of me, this neshama tahar, this pure soul, this itself has a value that is intrinsic, that is inherent, that is holy, and therefore I want, to, I want to elevate, I want to share, I want to show that I recognize, I appreciate, I understand, I value it, and it means more to me than anything else that is there in the world. So you has to understand there, Eirich Atzmei. The Rabbi Yoyna writes that the first step that a person needs to take in order to be able to serve a Kodesh Baruch in the right way is they must recognize Eirich Atzmai, they must recognize their value and their self-worth. And if a person does not understand who they are, they don't recognize what's inside of them, then with what will you ever serve Hashem? If you think you're just like a, I'm a, I'm a shmacha guy, what can I do? I'm a mediocre Jew, what can I do? I don't have the koichais, the talents, the abilities, the strengths, the, the, great, the great stuff that other people, I don't have that, so I'm just a regular person. If that's how you look at yourself, so then you'll never be able to dive in to the world of, to the world of mitzvahs, to the world of kedusha, to the world that HaKadosh Baruch Hu truly loves. Why? Because you have a, uh, a low self-esteem you have a, a low, a, a lack of self-esteem where you don't recognize the greatness that's inside of you. Says the Torah, when Yankala gives over here his money for the Erechim, he's giving the same exact amount as Reb Chaim Kanievsky. And when Reb Chaim Kanievsky is giving his money for the Erechim, he's giving the same that the Chavaz Chaim would have given. Because every neshama has, every neshama has Koyach, and every neshama has a power, and there's nothing that's making you any greater than me, or me any greater than you, if you just recognize that which is inside of you, you too, in fact, will be able to elevate yourself. I heard a maisa this week of a certain Rosh Hashiva from Eretz Yisrael, that he would come every year to collect money, and when COVID hit, so he was, he was absent from America for like two years or so. And after two years, he finally is coming back to America. And he had an Israeli driver that he used to go to, that used to take him around the streets of New York, wherever he wanted to go. This driver was not religious, but he was a very nice Israeli guy. No, she felt the, the Rosh Hashiva felt very comfortable with him. So he calls him before his trip to America and he says, I'm coming in on whatever Tuesday, JFK. Can you pick me up and drive me around like, like we used to do before COVID? 
And the guy says, no problem, no problem, Rebbe, whatever, I'll be happy to be there. And he comes. So she becomes, he lands in JFK, he gets his luggage, he walks outside. And the car pulls up. His old friend, the driver, will call him, whatever his name might be, will call him Yaniv. And he sees Yaniv, the taxi driver. And as he gets into the car, he sees that the Chiloni, the, the non-religious taxi driver, is religious. He's wearing a yarmulke. He can see that he has tzitzis on underneath. He's saying, Baruch Hashem, Bezrat Hashem, all the things. And the, and the Rosh Hashim is astounded. I didn't see it for two years. What took place the last two years during COVID? What, what happened to you? He says, let me tell you a story. And he says, about a year and a half ago, he said, you know, I drive the taxi, I drive Uber, I'm a, pri a private driver. A very wealthy man got my number and he calls me up for a ride and he says, I'm going to hire you to drive me from New York to an obscure place in Pennsylvania. And when I get to this place, you're going to have to wait. In, it's by a forest. You're going to have to wait for me until I come out of the forest. And then you're going to take me back to New York, to my house. So the Israeli guy starts getting a little bit nervous. And he says, like, where is he? He says, you can't ask any questions. I have something that I need to go to. He said, and I'll tell you more in the car when, when you pick me up. I'll explain more things to you. Are you willing to do this? Don't worry. I'm going to pay you handsomely. You'll get your money. You have nothing to worry about. And the guy says, okay, fine. Fine. He picks up this very wealthy man, not a Jew. The person was not a Jew. And they're driving in the car and the conversation starts going. And the man says, thank you very much for taking me. He says, I'm an extremely successful, powerful wealthy businessman. I have a big company. I have a lot of people that are working for me. I've made lots of money. I have everything. Is I'm good to go for many years. A few months ago, I wasn't feeling so well. I went to the doctors. They did all the exams. And you can only imagine, they told me that I have a very rare disease, some kind of a cancer. And they've tried everything. They can't do anything else. The doctor just told me a few days ago, that they've exhausted all of the possibilities to heal me. And he told me, my days are numbered. I only have about six months to live. I can't take that, he said. I began looking around and finding out, is there alternative medicine, other treatments that I can do? He said, I found out that there is a man who practices black magic, sorcery, he lives out in the forest over there, somewhere in Pennsylvania. And that's where we're going right now. We're going over there. You're going to have to pull in as much as you can. Then you'll leave me alone with him until I come back to the car. This is my last hope that he's going to be, that I'm going to get healed. Okay? They're driving and driving and driving. They finally get to the forest. There's a little bit of a clearing. He drives in. And in the distance, you see some kind of dilapidated shack. And the guy gets out of the car and he says to the driver, you need, he says, just wait here for me. I'll be back as soon as he finishes doing what he's supposed to do. So he goes, you need, he says he's going to be here for a long time. So he makes himself very comfortable. He leans back in the chair. He starts going to sleep. And about 20 minutes, a half an hour later, there's pounding on the wind. He jumps up and he looks and it's the man that he, that, that he had given the ride to. And the man starts saying, roll down the window, roll down the window. And he says to him, are you a religious Jew? He says, no. Do you keep kosher? He says, no. He says, do you learn the Bible every day and you pray to God? He said, no, I don't do any of that. He said, because this kishavmacher, this sorcerer that's in there, he, the way that he heals people is by relying upon the kaychas of tumba, the powers of impurity in this world. And every time he tries calling upon one of his names of impurity, he said he keeps getting blocked. And he asked me, are you Jewish? I said, I'm not Jewish. He said, are there any Jews that are around here that are keeping, keeping their Bible and their mitzvahs? He said, I don't know. I said, I have a, a driver. I think he might be Israeli. Go find out right now because as long as this man is here, 
His soul is blocking the powers of impurity from working. They said to him again, are you Jewish? Are you religious? I'm not religious, I'm Jewish. He said, he told me you have to drive 10 miles away so that you get out of the force field of your holiness and then he can do what he has to do. So he said, I left the guy there and I drove 10 miles out of the way. And I was sitting in the car and I was thinking to myself, there's a man in there who's trying to do tuma impurity. And he says, my soul, my soul that doesn't keep Shabbat, my soul that doesn't eat kosher, my soul that doesn't learn Torah, my soul that doesn't daven and pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu three times a day, my neshama that never put on tefillin, that doesn't keep Sukkot and Pesach and eat matzah, my soul is blocking the impurity? Is too much? He said, that must mean that the soul that HaKadosh Baruch has given me is gigantic. If that's the case, I better find out what I really have inside of me. And he looks at the Rosh Hashiv and he tells him, from that day on, I began to go and learn and discover. And I realized how beautiful the Torah is and the mitzvahs are and how Kodesh Baruch Hu loves me. And I became Choseh B'Tshuva. I became about Tshuva as a result. Says of Hirsch, the reason that you're giving this money is because you recognize the intrinsic value that HaKadosh Baruch Hu placed inside everybody's neshama. And therefore, I want to give HaKadosh Baruch I want to sanctify myself. I want to consecrate myself. Because I see what I'm able to accomplish, what I could do, how I could grow, how I could become greater. And this reminds me of a I can't even believe it. It's the, this Motzi Shabbos is the 25th and your site of Rav Moshe Sher, who was one of the leaders of Klal Yisrael in America. He was the man in the position of the liaison between the Gedoli Adur, the leaders of our generation, all the great Rabbanim, Klal Yisrael, and the government. And he found himself in this very unique position. He was this very special person. He was, he was, he was flooded with Torah and with Kedush and Yerah Shemayim. And he was very much in tune with the world. And he was able to do so many things for the Torah, for the benefit of Klal Yisrael. This Motzi Shabbos is 25th Yorzai. I remember when he passed away, his son, Rav Shimshin Sher, came to Baltimore and gave one of the most electrifying has spayed in eulogies that I had ever heard before in my life. And until this day, 25 years later, I still believe, I don't remember some of the things that he said in that has spayed. One of the things he asked was this question. And he said, my father used to say, Shimshi, why is it that after the Toichacha, after all of the Klalais, the rebuke that HaKadosh Baruch gives the Klal Yisrael, why is it that the next thing is er Erechen is a person consecrating themselves, dedicating their value to the base of Mikdash? What is the connection one to the other? And he said a beautiful, beautiful idea. And that is that the Klalais are really the Chach, it's the, it's the Musr, it's the rebuke, the lacing rebuke that HaKadosh Baruch gives the Klal Yisrael where he's saying, because you didn't do this, because you didn't do this, because you didn't do this, so all these troubles are going to befall you. And it's very hard when HaKadosh Baruch Hu's wrath is coming down to the world, when there is suffering and there is usurim and there is hardships in a person's life, it's very hard to stand up to all of them. He says, but do you know how you're myrich, you know how you measure the value of a person? The way in which you value the measure of a, the, the way you measure the value of a person is how, in fact, do they stand up to the tsarais, to the challenges, to the difficulties, to the pain that there is in life? How do they? And he says, that's why this part of the parsha comes afterwards, Erechim. After we went through all the clothes, the clothes are looking like they're destroyed. Let's see the real intrinsic value of it. And a person that is still standing 
and a person who sees the koiches that they have inside, and a person who recognizes that whatever HaKadosh Baruch Hu brought upon me is only for my own good because it's going to perfect me and make me into a better person and open my eyes up to see that maybe I'm being too lax in this area, in that area, in this area over here. I must improve myself. So then he stands up proudly and he says, I'm consecrating my value to the base of Mignosh because I appreciate the value that I have inside of myself. Said Rav Sher, that's how you know who a, the, who a person truly is in this world. After the clothes comes, are they still standing and serving a Kodesh Baruch? After the Toichacha, after the rebuke, after the difficulties in life, are they still waking up in the morning and serving Hashem and davening and keeping mitzvahs and learning Torah and doing, is that what they're doing? Or Rachman Lutzan is a person doing what we do the best. We, when the tough gets going, the going gets tough and we start to bail out on the rebunish. We say, Hashem, you bailed out on me? You brought all this upon me? So have a nice day. Maybe I'll see you another time. The value of the person is how they're standing at the end of the day. So there's a very famous story with Rav Moshe Sher, because Rav Moshe Sher was, as everybody knows, he was a person who was busy, busy, busy day and night, night and day. Nobody knows when he slept, when he rested, he was busy. He was busy learning. He was busy working on things for the government. He was busy meeting with Gedele Yisrael. He was busy making meetings for Agudas Yisrael. He was very, very busy all of the time. And it seemed to me that no matter what was going on, no matter how hopeless sometimes the situation was for Klal Yisrael, no matter how much pressure there was in the world against the Jewish people, Ramayisha Sher never, ever gave up an ounce of hope or despair. He just kept pushing through with everything that he got himself into. And somebody asked him one time, Rabbi Sher, how is it possible that with all of the, all of the pushback that you get from this official and that government and this law and this that's going in, how is it that when you want to build yeshivas, you want to build shuls, you want to build institutions, nothing goes easy? How is it that you never stop pushing and going forward? So he said, the reason is because of a story that my mother told me, which took place when I was a little child. And he said, the story is the following. When I was a young boy, I got very, very sick with a high fever, my body was burning up with fever. The doctor came, it was in the olden days when they would, you didn't have to sit online with your EPO for, the, for three hours to be seen by a doctor. You know how it is now, you call a doctor, you know, I'm sick today. Okay, we can see you in three weeks. No, 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 you know, I don't think you understand. Like I'm coughing up my lung right now and I have a high fever. I need to see a doctor. Well, I'm sorry, the doctor's booked until the end of the month. Okay, thank you very much. In the olden days, if somebody was sick, they called over the doctor and the doctor came running to your house. What a chiddish. A doctor who took the, what is Hippocratic oath? And he actually is sincere that he wants to help people, not just worry about if he can get the new model Tesla next, next month, because that's what all the doctors are driving these days in the parking lot. Actually doing his job to take care of people and heal people. The doctor comes running over and he looks at the boy and he says to the mother, he writes out a prescription, he says to the mother, this is the only medicine that can help your son. This is a matter of pikuch nefesh right now. You must get the medicine immediately. Otherwise, Mrs. Shea, I'm not sure what's going to happen to your child. I don't know if he's going to make it to me. So the mother looks at the prescription. They were very poor family. And she starts scraping together all the coins, whatever little bill she has lying in the house. And she puts it all together and she knows there is no way in the world that she has enough money to pay for this medication. So she takes out a tehillim and she starts davening and crying by her son's bed. And she's begging HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Reifei Chaylin, the master of all healing, Please, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, when I go to get the medicine, let me find favor in the eyes of the, of the pharmacist 
that he'll give me the medicine even if I don't have enough money to pay for it. Please, Hashem. She goes to the pharmacy. And to a great delight, the owner of the pharmacy is not there. So there's a pharmacist behind the counter. And she begins explaining, my son is very sick. He's burning up with fever. The doctor came and looked at him. He said, it doesn't look good. This is the only thing that can help. She, she, said, she said, please, sir, but you have to understand, this is all the money that I have. I, there's nothing else that I can do, please. But I'll make you a promise. If, in fact, you'll give me the medicine for the money that I have, I'll come, I'll work. After hours, I'll clean the store. I'll mop the floors. I'll sweep the floor. Whatever you need me to do, please, 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 save my child. The pharmacist was so heartbroken by this woman's tears. He said, okay, miss, don't worry. It's okay. And he takes whatever money she had and he fills the prescription. And in the olden days, you remember those of us that are old enough to remember, medicine didn't come in plastic bottles. It came in glass jars. And he gives her the glass jar and he puts it into a into a brown paper bag, and she goes running back towards her house. She's got the elixir of life in her hand. The streets are very crowded. She's pushing her way through to get, she's trying to get home, 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 quick as quick as she can. At one point, she trips a little bit on the street and she bangs into a person, and the next thing she knows, the bag slips out of her hand, falls onto the ground and cracks into many pieces, and the medicine is gone. And now Mrs. Cher is destroyed and devastated. She picks up the broken bag, she holds it in her hand, and she goes back to the pharmacy. What she's gonna say this time, she has no idea. She comes to the pharmacy and lo and behold, the owner of the pharmacy is there. And she walks over with the broken bag. She starts crying from the moment she opens her mouth. And she's trying to explain. The pharmacist can't even understand. She's crying so heavily. He says, lady, I don't understand what you're saying. Please compose yourself. She finally pulls herself together. She says, my son, he's dying at home with a high fever. This is the only medicine. I barely have any money. I use whatever I have. I don't have any money left. And the bag broke by mistake. I don't have any money left. How am I getting the medicine? And the owner says, let me see the bag. And he takes the bag and he smells and he looks inside. And he said, Mrs. Cher, your son has angels that are protecting him. He has angels protecting him. He said, you know what's in this bottle? Whoever filled the bottle made a very big mistake. And if you would have given this medicine to your son, it would have killed him on the spot. He wouldn't be alive anymore. There's angels that are watching your son. I can't believe that it broke. We gave you the wrong thing. I feel so bad. You know what? I'll give you the bottle of the medicine. It's on the house. Please take the medicine and go take care of your son. So Mr. Cher ran home carefully this time. She gave her son the medicine. And obviously he took it and he was healed. And he got better and was strong. And he lived a long, robust life. He got sick in the end of his life, but the, all the years of his strength, he lived a robust life, and he did maybe hundreds of thousands of things on behalf of Klal Yisrael. So Ramosh Shasher said that when he was a little bit older, he didn't know the story. When he was older, Mrs. Sher told his son, you see, Maishi, when that bottle broke, I was on the brink of total despair. I saw the darkness no, with absolutely no hope of survival. But soon I learned that at precisely the moments that I thought were the gloomiest, they were actually the beginnings of Hashem's salvation. So Moshe Hashem said, from these words of my mother, I learned, you never give up hope. Until the very last moment, if HaKadosh Baruch who wants to, he can save us from harm. He can send us brachas. He can make things turn around for the good. We can never lose faith in Hashem ever. And that's the message that he gave of the Klamas. 
Clothes come in life. Tragedies come in life. Very big nisyonis come in life. Hardships come in life. Musa from the rebellion comes in life. But a Jew is never allowed to give up hope. He has to keep going and going and going and going and showing how much he believes in the rebellion to show them how much he's going to stand up to the challenge, how much he is going to do what is right the Eile Hashem in the eyes of Hashem. And I will just end off with the words of the Rebbeinu Bechaya, who says, who brings on a Midrash Tanchuma, and it says, Oma Kodesh Baruch Hashem says, Li Yisrael to the Jewish people, if you will bring Erechen, you will bring these offerings before me where you are consecrating yourself. I will look at it as if as if you have brought yourselves as a korban, as a sacrifice before me. When you appreciate your value, when you understand who you are, when you're ready to ride the storm and go to the next level, you become a sacrifice, a korban in the eyes of Hashem. And as it says in so many of the korbanos in the Torah, reach nifayach la Hashem, it is a pleasing fragrance before the Rebbein Shaim. Wouldn't you like to be a pleasing fragrance? before Hashem and not a smelly, unpleasing fragrance. Everybody would like to smell like some the new flavor of Axe than to smell like some old putrid something, Barbasol or whatever it is. Everybody wants to smell good. A person who is doing the mitzvahs, a person who appreciates the value, the Eirich Atzmoy, a person that is consecrating their life to the Rebbein Shalom, you are a reach nichayim. You are the sweetest smelling fragrance before the Rebbein Shalom. May we be zayichim yes Hashem that we appreciate who we truly are. We see the inner value, the inner strengths and the kaychais. We don't get lost in the klolais, but rather we keep our eye focused in on the brachas that Hashem wants to send and the natsachus as we are offering ourselves before the Rebbe Yisrael Makodesh Baruch, will make the ultimate reach nichayach when the sacrifices of Klal Yisrael are once again burning on the Mizbeach in the Beis Hamikdash in the Bayis Shlishi, the Meherav Yameinu.